and we are now recording. Okay, hello. This is the uh, July 31st meeting of the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, which was organized to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. Um, those goals and the plan for getting there were adopted from the Climate Action Adaptation and Resilience Plan, or the CARP, which was accepted by the town council in 2021. Um, it uses 2016 as a base year and calls for a 25% reduction in carbon emissions by 2025 and a 50% by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. So this committee has two primary functions. One is to advise the town council and recommend or propose policies or actions that will help us meet the goals. And two, to promote a just, equitable and speedy climate response through outreach and engagement of town and local stakeholders. So with that in mind, we will start with today's agenda, the first unwritten rule of which is to find a note taker. And I think Steve, you're on, yep. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it. The names got rearranged in the order, but um, Oops. I'm, it's okay, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm on it. Um, and then the first official thing on the agenda then is to review the minutes. Um, I have them queued up if you want me to share. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and put them up if you have them. Did look over them. I didn't see anything that needed changing myself. So why don't you go ahead and scroll through, maybe make it a little bigger. Yeah. I saw the press release for the CCA. Yay. I think I saw something about Valley Bike too. In the Gazette. You did. Yes, you did. All right. And with that. Anyone want to move that we accept the minutes? That we accept the minutes? Yeah, we need a motion that we accept them. Sorry. A motion that we accept them. <laughs> yeah, a motion and a second. I can second. Okay. Oh, we have them. Okay, so Laura, I, I didn't hear what you said. I guess you, you moved and Tony seconded, correct? All right, good. Yeah. So um, we need, uh, Don, we will need you to be on camera for your official vote. So in no particular order, Goldner? Yes. McElrath? Yes. Issing? Uh, abstain. Roof? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Allison? Yes. Thank you so much. Minutes are approved. Okay, the next agenda item is public comment, but I don't see that we have any public here. Um, so I think we should go on to education and outreach. Um, so the first item on that agenda is always PACE. Don, any, any more news on PACE or Stephanie? No, there is no update on the PACE program. Okay, um, coordination with local groups, Tony? Anything new? No updates. Um, I don't have anything new for heat pumps, I think, unless Stephanie does. A little bit. Um, just to say, this could have been a staff update, but I'll give it to you now. <laughs> um, <laughs> just that we uh, have approved the, the town manager today, actually approved the price proposal. Um, we had received a revised price proposal. And so we went with the original um, and we have gotten in touch with the consultant and we are hoping to get a contract together and executed. I'm really hoping by the end of next week at the latest is my fingers crossed hope. Um, so that we can move forward, but we cannot, still can't announce who it is until we have a fully executed contract. So my apologies for keeping you all in suspense. Okay, looking forward to that. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I'm tired of not being able to say who it is. <laughs> so, yep, yep. sorry. Um, I have a small, if there's nothing else on heat pumps, I've That's been on it. vacation, so I haven't done anything else. Um, <laughs> 
with that. Uh, I did have a small update on climate resilient schools, just that I posted a link. They haven't been active. I checked the Slack channel and there's been nothing since May, um, probably since the end of the school year, I guess. My guess is they're just not doing much over the summer, but I posted a link to the Mass CEC Green School Works that Laura brought to our attention last time. And I just did that a couple hours ago. I've only, this is my first day back from vacation. So I just did it um, not even like an hour ago. Um, so uh, I haven't heard back yet, but at least they have that link now and perhaps somebody there will follow up on that. If not, I will prod them a little bit, keep an eye on that channel every now and then and prod them a little bit. Um, that's all I got. It's been a slow couple of weeks. So I did a lot of bicycling in the heat. So pumping in the heat, but no heat pumps. <laughs> um, so going on from there, uh, you know what? I'm not on the right page. Hold on a minute. There we are. Now I'm on the right page. Uh, going on from there, um, Steve, anything more on the building rental building efficiency bylaw? Or on no solar updates. Okay, or on solar also. No Actually, updates there either. Yeah, I, I don't have connected. I'm uh -huh. sorry, not to interrupt. I have something on the rental bylaw. I think there was a question. You're going to have to give me a minute to just get on to my. Oh, right, um, right. There was. Yep. Uh, about regarding when I think or wh what was going to happen to the data and the information. So right. you're going to have to give me a minute. Hold on. Yes, thank you for remembering that, Stephanie. Actually, if you want to go forward and then come back to me, I'll I'll give you that information. Uh, was there anything on solar, Steve? No, I haven't been able to attend the CRC meetings in the last couple of weeks, so I don't know what the status is. I suspect they're still slogging through trying to prepare a draft to bring back to the town council. Yeah, Stephanie they did may have more updates when she gets caught up. Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, transportation, Tony, anything else? No updates. Okay, regional and state policy, I have a little bit. I um, wrote, I called this morning Mindy Dome's office to find out what was going on with the climate bill, which was last I knew in committee being resolved between the House and the Senate. I got a urgent email this morning from Rewiring America of all places. Uh, asking us to call our representatives. So I called Mindy to find out what was going on and it was still in committee. Mindy Dome, of course, supports it. Um, but the problem is that this is supposed to be the last day of the session. And as far as I know, it hasn't been, um, was, it hasn't been, what's it called when they work to resolve differences? Uh, com the conference committee hasn't come to a conclusion yet, right? So that's really bad. And I gather from the Rewiring America uh, note that it's the chair of the house in Massachusetts who might be holding it up because the request was uh, to ask us to, let me get this right, um, if anyone else wants to do this at the last minute, maybe they're not, maybe they'll move, make the session last a little longer, but this is a little scary if they don't pass anything. Um, Jeffrey Roy, please tell Chairman Jeffrey Roy that Massachusetts residents are calling for a climate bill to be passed before the end of the legislative session. So that's supposed to be today. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm finding it much more difficult to figure out where a bill is and what's going on in Massachusetts than it is federally. Federally, it's very easy to look up bills and know exactly what the status is. In Massachusetts, Unless I get an email, I have no clue or call my representative and ask. So it might be a good idea. This is a request for, you know, anyone who's interested to call Mindy, call your representative. I assume we're all Mindy Dome, right? That's Amherst is Mindy Dome. Just call her and ask again to get uh, Chairman Jeff Roy to get that bill passed before the end of the legislative session. So I don't know what the, I don't know, maybe it's out of conference and into the house and they're just waiting to vote on it. I just, I don't know what the status is, um, but that was the request we got from Rewiring America this morning. Actually, that was yesterday, end of the day yesterday. Um, 
That's my only update. So back to, uh, are you ready yet, Stephanie, to talk Sure. About? Go ahead. Yep, so, um, so I had reached out to, um, sorry, Rob Mora and, um, Oh, I just had it and I just, there it is. Um, so my question, you know, to him was, do we have, you know, do we know where the data will live um, and that the inspectors will be gathering from their inspections? And his response was, we haven't figured that all out yet, but I know we'll be using open, open gov in some capacity to track inspections. The intent is to have inspection reports available for public access and viewing, which I expect will include the data collected during inspection. We'll be building the inspection program this fall slash winter. So I would expect that, you know, starting in winter, I would anticipate it won't be before January, if not even a little later, that information will start being made available. It sounds like it's going to be in the individual data uh, inspection reports and not in a spreadsheet somewhere, which means that we're going to need another intern to go through and <laughs> inventory, look at all of the um, reports and make some sort of a database for us, right? Well, uh, uh, there may be, I mean, there may be ways where we could access that with our internal um, permitting apps. So I, I don't know that that's absolutely true, Lori. So you know, we'll figure that out when they start. Right. And I had meant to play with the Zillow search and I just completely forgot. Well, I also didn't, I was on vacation, so I didn't do anything. I just bicycled. <laughs> um, I will put that on my do list again for this week to see if I can, if there's some way to slurp data off of Zillow in a way that makes it easy to figure out what the heating source is for some of the larger, um, for some of the rental units that have, you know, multiple housing units in them. All right. Um, uh, network geothermal, I think we we're probably well, done with that for the while, but is there anything, any more updates on that, Laura? Oh, wait, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. I was just going to ask if Stephanie had any updates on solar on this, the CRC process. Yeah. yeah. So at the last meeting, they I think they touched on it at the end, but neither Chris Brestrup nor I were in attendance. Um, they were, from my understanding, they weren't going to talk about it at all. And then they ended up touching base at the end. And I think the chair requested that members um, submit questions for staff uh, or just questions in general about the solar bylaw for discussion at the next meeting. So my understanding is that the next meeting, they're going to be entertaining questions that members have regarding the current draft, but uh, you know, the, but staff don't believe that it's even in a, a full draft form yet. It seems like there's still a lot that needs to be addressed with what they did because they had some, they had questions actually, even on the, the current draft and where some items belonged and some items that they wanted to flush out. So I'm not really sure what the point of the questions were at this at this stage, but I think we'll, you know, that'll that'll maybe be discussed at the next meeting. So I'm hoping that we can sort of get them to focus on getting a full draft together so that it can be distributed. It's just not there yet. <laughs> Okay, and um, <clears throat> next, if there's nothing else on A through D, we're at E, which is network geothermal. I think we sort of dotted the I's and crossed the T's on that one. There's nothing more to be done on that at this point, right? Because there's not another open competition, right? I think. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything. I think it's to learn from... Oh no, we talked about last time we we noted that Deerfield was one of the No, that was something different. Deerfield got something. Got a grant. Oh, they did. No. They got the grant for a scoping study on network geothermal. So, I think um Stephanie was going to reach out to them and see if she can get any intel on what they're doing or how it's going. Um 
I don't think we need to keep it on the agenda per se, but I think that would be the next step to learn what they're doing and then keep an eye out for future opportunities. I did not follow up. Okay. I haven't had a chance, so, but I will. Okay. Yeah, I'm assuming they just recently got it, so I don't know that there's much information yet, but that's something just to leave on our list. Yeah. Let's leave it on um, a couple more weeks until we find out a little bit more about Deerfield. We'll leave it as Network Geothermal Deerfield, right? And so that we just, just to learn about what they're doing. Um, and then maybe take it off uh, the agenda for a while after that. In that same vein, I think um, I, we're gonna get staff updates later, but I think we probably need to put on the education outreach, the CCA, um, as something we need to start talking about on a regular basis, right? Now that it's there. Yeah, I'll have more information. I mean, uh, that's gonna be coming up education and outreach there's a specific plan that was put together and submitted as part of the application and it's not quite as simple as just i mean it is on some level going out there but you know we have to make sure that the information that's being um, submitted to the public and shared with the public is you know consistent with what dpu approves right. um, you know it has to be presented with specific information so um We'd want to make sure anything that goes out, our consultant wants a copy of, and they want to review it before it goes out to the public. So okay. it's not a simple matter of ECAC can just do their own thing. You need to actually work very closely with me so that I can work closely with a consultant. But there's lots to do, and there's lots of opportunity. So, but we'll have materials. They'll they'll actually the consultant will provide us with materials. Okay. So I think you know that's um, you know that's how we'll sort of approach that. Yeah, and if they want to use this time to maybe talk to folks about about the CCA, maybe we can let them do a webinar, right? Mm -hmm. As we've done in the past. Absolutely, that this would be um, a great um, opportunity for that. There's gonna, we have to do a large scale public um, outreach effort um, information session with all three communities. We're going to be doing a, a big one. And then each community is probably going to do more of their own. So this would be great to have an opportunity to do our own. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think if um, the fellow isn't here yet, it's quite early. I think what we should do, let's see. Oh, the community climate workshop. That's right. We were going to have a, um, let's move on to, uh, number six, while we're waiting for the um, presentation on the fleet vehicle inventory. So Don asked that we do that at the next meeting. He wasn't quite prepared for this one. Something came up uh, with work. So he's with us, but he's not able to actually give any kind of a presentation tonight. On the, so we'll um, do it at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, in that case, we're at the town manager goals discussion. And I admit to having done absolutely nothing with that because I was, again, on vacation. <laughs> um, I had many, many days on a bicycle just listening to music and pedaling. Um, so let's just think about it a little bit and start the discussion. I want to see if I can find last year's um, report. Um, which I think I might reinvent because I wasn't crazy over the format. I thought it was a bit hard to get through, but I would like to ask, I mean, one of the easiest things for everyone to do is to maybe from your own perspective and the things that you were working on this last year, like for example, Tony, you know, in interaction with other local groups um, and, you know, Steve, the solar bylaw, um, maybe write a, you know, just a paragraph or two um, on what you have accomplished and what you see as what we need, right? What's needed next? What do we need from the town? What do we need from the town manager next? Um, keeping in mind these two categories of, uh, you know, ad advice and, and policy versus outreach. Um, and education, where you think the opportunities are 
for the town to step in um, and for what we might do, right? So Stephanie, did you have your hand up? Is there a, okay, let me see if I can find, I know I have it here somewhere. Let me just look for it, report, annual report, I just saw it. Annual report final. And there is also a synopsis, which is here. Both of them. So I, I, this is Michael. I wasn't here last time where yeah. you're talking about town manager goals and reports. Can can someone give just a quick background of the kind of purpose, like, um, and kind of what I, I guess maybe sharing the report is probably the best thing. Um, yep. Okay. Just kind of um, catch me up real quick on this. Right. I can share. Uh, last year's report, and I will also share the synopsis, which is only three pages, so why don't I just put it up? So um, the report itself is is rather long, um, but let me share this. Hang on a minute. Where's the share thing? There it is. I want to share annual report synopsis. This was a synopsis that I gave to the town council and I think this is the final version. I hope it is. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger. Get this out of the way. Oh, come on, here we go. Edit you. Zoom. I do that and then make it a little bigger. Come on. All right. Uh, so last year um, Vasu had sort of divided us into five different, uh, and this was to some extent based on the CARP, if I remember right, different uh, areas that we were working in. One was regional and state policies, building energy, solar power, transportation, and PACE. And so he wrote a little report summarizing each of these areas. And this was a summary that I gave after he moved on. Um, and I became chair, I took his report and summarized it and gave a little, uh, showed up at a town council meeting and gave a little report. Um, and it was mostly just, a, for the first part, it was a recap of everything that had been done, uh, that we got the zero energy municipal building bylaw. Um, we had done that many years earlier and we're then looking for, uh, at the point we were looking for us to be adopters of the new specialized code, which, which happened. Um, so we advocated for Amherst to join the then 19 communities who were adapt adopters of the new specialized code, building code. code. Um, in heat pumps, it, we were talking pretty much about the same sort of thing we were talking about now, except we also did a couple of, we, last year we did a lot of um, webinars. I think we did something like five webinars in all. Uh, and a couple of them were on heat pumps. So we talked about that. We talked about solar power. The lo last year was when the long planned solar landfill project finally went online, yay. There was a lot of, lot of exciting news in that front. Um, and I think the solar bylaw was still very early in the discussion stages at this point. Oh, there it was. So, yeah, the town created, right. That was underway. In transportation, we had hosted a webinar on electric vehicles. Um, and we had... Uh, members engaging with the transportation something committee, transportation, what's the A? I don't remember what it stands for, um, but this is the- Transportation Advisory Committee, advisory I think. Advisory Committee. Um, or something. Reminding them of the CARP and just interacting with them as I think Tony is still doing, right? Which is great. Um, and there was also the installation of fast charging systems, the reestablishment of the e-bike network, which is finally coming to fruition now. And then uh, 
PACE was just at that point, and still is sort of an informational thing that this program exists. We were waiting at that point for the rules on it to be finalized. Hopefully this is the year where we'll actually get the word out and maybe even get a first candidate to use this PACE system to update their building. Um, so with all of that in mind, and with another further note that we really need to find more ways to get renters involved. That was an issue that came up a lot last year. Um, we put together what we hoped would be town manager goals. I don't remember which of these got adopted. It got pared down to like a few. <laughs> I think the town council in the end, right, is what works with the town manager to put together goals. Is that how it works, Stephanie? Well, yeah, they they work with, I mean, the town manager goals are really sort of proposed by the town manager with staff input, but ultimately those are presented to the town council and they basically adopt right. those. So this is us reporting to the town council what we think and to the town manager what we think ought to be in his goals. And then he goes from that and, and you know, picks and chooses and makes something that he thinks he can actually get done. Um, so it's it's worth having our input, right? Having him think about, it makes him think about what's what's important to us, right? That we want him to be thinking about. Um, so top of the list was still getting more staff and um, still hope that can happen one of these days and maybe ought to stay on the list. Um, we wanted to see the town manager take a more active role in promoting energy efficient retrofits um, this new climate bank, uh, turned out to be a little bit of a red herring. Um, it came up, but it hadn't actually been approved yet. It, it's, it was sort of, it's probably worth looking into again. Um, it came up right at the end of the year as something that uh, I think Maura Healy was pushing a, a fund basically to, uh, to a way to fund retrofits in affordable housing and uh, other projects. Um, but the amount of money actually dedicated to it was pretty small. And I think it was waiting for a bill that I don't think ever happened unless it's in this climate bill. So I'm not sure how real this climate bank is, but that's something to look into again. Um, so just to, uh, just to clarify for a bit more, so it's, it's related to the IRA. So for some of the money that's coming out of the federal government, mm -hmm. state, to be able to access this, states have to develop green banks. Ah, okay. So the green bank was developed and Massachusetts was one of the first ones to do it when the IRA, after the IRA was passed, like Connecticut and others have had them for longer. Um, and we were the first ones to tie it to affordable housing, to the affordable housing trust, I think is where it lives, maybe. Yeah, it's, um, in, mass housing. it's in mass housing. Mass housing. Okay. So, so yeah. So I don't know if the IRA fund, I haven't followed it since this, like have the IRA funds come through if they started using it or not. Um, I just saw that there was a press release from May, Mar from April about it. Um, yeah. but so I'm looking at, I'm on the page now that still pretty much only it has the press release from April 4th, 2024, and then it has one additional latest news that says they've actually launched their first consumer loan product, and that was April 29th, so it was shortly after that. Oh no, it's the same thing, it just says that it's there. So I don't know what it's actually funding. If it's actually funding anything, they haven't published it yet, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know where this thing is. They do have something they call an energy saver home loan program. Uh, new $20 million initiatives. So that looks new. That looks like it might be under this. So there does seem to be um, low interest rate second mortgages to provide a variety of energy related home improvements. No cash down, blah, blah, blah. So, so there does seem to be at least one program and there are some people to contact now. Um, it's being run by CET. 
So it does seem to actually be there. So that might be something to look into um, that you know we want to bring to their attention. Maybe we should put that on the agenda for next time, just as a uh, as a. I don't, I'm not sure that's a policy or an outreach thing, but we should and we should educate ourselves a little bit about it. Um, so maybe it's an education thing <laughs> for educating ourselves and then eventually other people. Um, so that was one of the goals, you know, just generally getting getting heat pumps, getting folks to start doing the transition. There's a lot, I don't know about everyone else's neighborhoods, but my neighborhood has been talking a lot about the energy transition. There was a call recently, I got a note from a neighbor asking, do you think it'd be nice, worth having a neighborhood meeting where we all uh, exchange information on, you know, what contractors we used and what heat pump system we ended up with and et cetera, et cetera. And I was an enthusiastic yes on that. I don't know if it's actually going to happen, but there's a lot of need for more information out there. And so uh, there were a number of goals that were sort of around um, around heat pumps and retrofits generally. Um, in regards to transportation, there were the DC fast charging stations that we were wanting to see installed that were on the way. I think that was an easy goal. I think that's been done now, right? Um, I'll report out. Okay. Um, the implementation of the CCA and efforts to adopt the specialized code were priorities and those of course have happened. And just pointing out, there was some concern last year that perhaps the communication between different departments in the town wasn't always so great around sustainability that people were missing opportunities. And so we asked for the town manager to be a little more diligent around that and that making sure that he coordinated with Stephanie um, about using that climate lens in, in every decision. So those were the sorts of things we came up with last year. And this is just sort of paraphrasing. I think there was actually a bulleted list of about 20 goals. And I was trying to paraphrase them a little bit here and connect them more directly to the things that ECAC had been working on higher up in the document. Do, do we know if, since we made these as recommendations to the council, do you know if the council adopted any of these to include in the in their town manager goals? I think all that really happens with this <laughs> is you know the documents that we give them which included this little summary sheet and the report itself go to they hear about it and then it goes to the town manager and i imagine that the town manager then comes back with something I, there's discussion at the meeting i had a lot of questions right i spent a lot of time fielding questions but i think that's the main thing it's mostly about if, if they do anything more with it i i didn't hear about it i don't know stephanie is there Anything so, else? sorry, Laura, um, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I do have open, there's a, I do have open the town manager goals for climate action that we can look at. Um, ah, go ahead, share them. Okay, here. Let's see what actually got in there. <laughs> um, It's much smaller than what, so, if I remember correctly, we also shared these draft goals with counselors separate from the, the annual report, but this is the final 2024 goals around climate. Can everybody read that? Yes. Okay. And they just summarize some of what you said. They're just not, but they right. touch on almost all the areas. Yeah. yeah. So I do think we have influence to the extent that we can get our goals, draft goals to the council ahead of when they start talking about them, which I'm not sure the date is. Maybe we can ask Rekha or someone else. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the important thing. The other thing is, I don't even remember who our liaison is this year, but um, do you remember her name, Stephanie? Who was it's Alicia idea? Walker. Uh, it's, it's Alicia Walker. Was it somebody else? No, I thought it was Freca now. Oh, I'm sorry. It is Freca. I, I yeah, apologize. Yeah. He was last year. Alicia or she was last year. Him. He's now. Yep. Right. And, and he has, he's copied on, I do have him on the list. 
That's on right. The distribution list. So All right. He doesn't attend any of the meetings. He did say earlier on that he was going to be uh, watching the videos, mm -hmm. but um, I, I feel like I should probably reach out <laughs> at some point and at least let him know this is coming and and what you know what to expect and if he has any suggestions for us as well in putting this together and reporting it out. So yeah, I, maybe we could even just invite him to one meeting coming up and we can talk about it. Right. Right. So let's put that on the agenda for some time in uh, I think late August or early September with the idea of finishing these things up by the end of September. Does that work? I think last year I reported in October. It wasn't until October that I got into the town meeting. And at the same time, we probably ought to try to get ourselves a slot in the town meeting because as I recall, that took a lot of time. <laughs> we had asked for a slot in June and we ended up speaking and ended up speaking in October. Um, so we might we might start working on both of those simultaneously on putting these goals together and then also reserving ourselves a spot to talk about them maybe in early october yeah and just a note too that most committees you know like when they do an annual report um don't present typically don't present to the council they just provide a report so mm -hmm. You know, you all specifically ask to be, you know, part of an agenda. So right. that's partly why is because you're not going to get a whole lot of time and they're going to yeah. squeeze it in amongst a million other things that they're doing. And not because they don't care, but because they just have yeah. a lot that they're covering. And, and it's not standard practice that committees do this. That's why. Yeah, I think it's, I do think it's important though. Um, and it gives them a chance to ask questions. Um, keeps us a little better connected. So I would like to request that slot again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a pain in the neck for me to <laughs> put together too, but uh, you know, it, I think it was, my feeling was it was worthwhile. It, yeah. Know. And my, to be clear, I'm not dissuading you. Yeah. I'm only stating because you said it took so long. Why? Oh, I just you know it got yeah. worked in. I just want to be clear for everybody so that people don't think it's yep. just because they don't care. It's just not standard practice. Right. That's all. I understand. So meanwhile, if I can please ask everyone um, maybe in the next week so I can pull something together for the two weeks from now meeting by next a week from today on Wednesday, if you could, uh, you know, if there is something you've been working on in the last year, uh, maybe write a little note and just summarize a couple of paragraphs, what you think the important things were. And if you have any requests, you know, if there's anything you'd like to see, added to a goal, um, definitely stick that in too. And I'll try to synthesize something out of that and my own knowledge and maybe a little bit and adding some continuity from last year's report. Um, all right, so I think. Honey's joined us. And Honey is here. So um, I think with that, maybe if there's nothing else on town manager goals for now, we'll have a deeper discussion next time. Let's go on to um, Honey's report. So Stephanie, you wanna do the introductions? Sure. Um, so it's absolutely my pleasure to introduce Honey Gala to the committee members. Um, Honey has worked with me for the last uh, eight weeks or so on putting together a fleet vehicle emissions greenhouse gas inventory, uh, as well as a timeline for transition. And so tonight she's gonna give you a summary, but she is putting together an actual report that will be submitted at the end of her uh, project time period, which really extends for at least another week. Um, so I will, with that, let Honey take over and share her screen. Honey, unless you need me to do it, um, just let me know um, and she'll present her Thank Project. you so much, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, I don't see the option to share the screen if you don't mind doing it. Sure, absolutely. Just give me one second and I will get that going. Okay. Sorry, just give me a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. 
Okay, I'm going to go to the slideshow and hope that I don't lose the screen. Is this slideshow in our packet? No, you, it will be after. It's not in yet, but it will be. Great. It has to be. Good. Um, can you see this as a slideshow or are right. you still seeing my other? We'll see it in like a present mode. Seeing presenters mode. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I'm having a hard time with my sharing my screen. It sort of goes away. So I'm yeah. sorry. You might have to just see it this way. That's fine. You can also try display settings at the top. See it? No. Oh, oh yeah. Yep. Uh, there we go. All right. Great. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. All right. So, honey, take it away. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this past summer, I've been working on the municipal fleet greenhouse gas emission and transition timeline for the town. Uh, I am a UNH, a University of Sustainability Institute Sustainability Fellow. Uh, in this summer, I had a pleasure working with Stephanie on this project. Uh, next slide, please. For this project, the goals were to collect the data on the fuel usage and calculate municipal fleet greenhouse gas emission for 2023. There is also a transition timeline to help reduce municipal fleet by 2025, uh, sorry, 2050, the zero emission by 2050. I have also evaluated some of the zero emission vehicles that are currently in the market and the charging infrastructure that will be needed uh, for those vehicles. Here is a breakdown of the current fleet emission uh, for 2023. And as you can see, the fleet emission by department, DPW has one of the highest emission. DPW is the de uh, Department of Public Works. It has about 34% of emissions. And then followed by that is school, uh, police department, and fire department. Oh, school is about 24%. Uh, the reason, even though the school has less vehicles than DPW, it's because of the diesel usage. Uh, same for the police department and the fire department. All the other departments have one or less than one emission, but they still do contribute to the overall greenhouse gas emission uh, for the town. On the oh, right. Quick question. Sorry. Yeah. Are, are you looking just at, at vehicle? Are all these vehicles owned by the town, or are there some leased? And if so, are the owned by the town? Hmm? They are owned by the town. Okay. Do we lease vehicles as well from the for the schools, for example? Uh, yes, but they they are not included in this okay. uh, emission. Uh, it, they are not included in the calculations. All right. Okay. Uh, on, on in the right. Uh, the municipal fleet GRG emission is based on the vehicle type. So there are basically two types, on-road vehicles and off-road vehicles. In on-road, there is light-duty vehicles and heavy-duty vehicles. Light-duty vehicles includes uh, SUVs, sedans, and the small school vans. And heavy-duty vehicle includes the fire trucks, sewage trucks, and also the school buses. For off-road emission, is equipments that the town has, uh, like the construction equipments, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, used by DPW. So as you can see, heavy duty has the highest of the emission, which is about 52%, and then followed by light duty vehicles, which is 44%. Next slide, please. Why do we have to choose zero, vehicle, uh, zero emission vehicle or Conventional vehicles because they have environmental and economic benefits. Environmental benefits are improve air quality, reduces greenhouse gas emission, and health benefits. And economic benefits is low fuel costs, low maintenance costs, regulatory compliances, and government incentives. The economic benefits will also vary depending on which vehicle type you choose. There are a few different vehicle types that are available in the market but some do not uh, match with this criteria, but some do. Next slide, please. Uh, so what qualifies as zero emission vehicle? So as you can see, the first one is the conventional vehicle. Uh, these vehicles are uh, these vehicles run on diesel and gasoline and have the highest of emission. Then comes the hybrid uh, vehicles, 
which do use regenerative braking to produce electricity, but still run major, ma majorly on fossil fuel. Then comes plug-in hybrid. Plug-in hybrid runs on electric energy until the battery runs out of charging, but then switches to fossil fuel. The 100% zero emission vehicle are considered uh, one either battery operated or electric vehicle and hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. These have no emission. Oh, next slide. So this is a comparison of what is the difference between the lithium ion battery and the hydrogen fuel cell. As you can see, the lithium ion battery uh, cars have the lithium ion battery that converts uh, the electric current by moving between negative to positive charge. There is also an onboard charger that converts the AC electricity to the uh, DC power and that helps the electric motor to run, the propeller of the car to run, and that generates energy and that helps the car moving. When it comes to hydrogen fuel cell, there is an added fuel tank, which has hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas that is stored in the uh, in the fuel tank is then transferred to the fuel stack and then that combines with hydrogen and oxygen from the outside to generate electricity, which is then transferred to the electric motor, which generates the energy for the car to run. And there is also a battery stored in, in there, the, like how it's in hybrid vehicles that helps with regenerative braking uh, electric energy. Uh, hydrogen vehicles are like very pop are not very popular these days because the technology is very new. These vehicles are still being explored in California, but haven't made their way here in New England or Massachusetts. The most popular vehicles, zero zero emission vehicle today, are electric vehicles. The reason hydrogen fuel cell is not much explored is because there are some safety issues and also they are very expensive. A uh, hydrogen fuel, uh, fuel cell also required a separate charging station, uh, which uh, is an added cost to the vehicle's cost. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the charging infrastructure that is needed for hydrogen fuel cell and an electrical vehicle. The electrical vehicle, you can see the electrical charging these days everywhere, like around, like even town of Amherst has about seven of the electrical ports, but hydrogen fuel cell uh, charging, uh, hydrogen fuel cell refueling stations haven't been explored much. The electrical charging time is four to six hours on level two and level three is 30 minutes to one hour. But when it comes to hydrogen fuel cell, it's only four to five minutes. Even though there are like benefits of get, uh, having a hydrogen fuel vehicle than an electric vehicle, uh, the technology is still new and it's been explored and, uh, and it's not, uh, and, and the electric vehicle has been with us for decades. So we, have had made good progress with those vehicles, but hydrogen fuel is still new. So uh, there are safety issues that are, uh, uh, it's it's also expensive to have hydrogen vehicle. The refueling also cost about $36 per kilogram, which is uh, way more than what, I which is three times more than what uh, gasoline would cost or even the electric charging would cost due to its due to lack of infrastructure and like lack of techno uh, technology hasn't been explored yet. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the charge since electric vehicles are priority for the town for the time being. This is uh, an example of how much electric, electric charging infrastructure the town would need to support these vehicles. When it comes to the small sedans and SUVs, uh, it, it needs about 0.6 kilowatt hour per mile. But when it comes to heavy duty vehicle like the fire trucks, it will need about 3.6 kilowatt per mile. So depending on that, the charging infrastructure would need to be increased uh, than what the town has today. 
these are the uh, incentives for zero emission vehicle which are currently available uh, which are currently uh, available when you purchase an electric vehicle so there are state incentives and federal incentives State incentives are up to 7,500 for purchase of an all electric vehicle and 5,000 if the electric vehicle is on lease. And plug in hybrids also have some benefits, which is 5,000 up to purchase of, of a plug in hybrid vehicle and 3,000 for the lease. These incentives have already been used by the town, which, which uh, with the vehicles they have purchased before. And, uh, and it, it would be great to use them in the future as well. Um, there have been federal funding allocated to the town and three electric school buses will be uh, given to Amherst as a part of a federal funding program, which was uh, done by Environmental Protection Agency. So the town will have three electric school buses uh, in the next few months. There are also some incentives by green communities, which the town is already a part of. Next slide. These are uh, these incentives are specifically designed for the electric vehicle in, uh, in these are specifically designed for the electric charging infrastructure. As you can see, there are 60% of cost of level one or level two EV charging stations and up to 50,000 per street address. There are uh, also grants over 80% of the cost of level two charging stations. There are some grants given by the utility companies as well. Like the town is getting two DC charger by the end of this summer and the utility uh, company has provided with like most of its infrastructure costs, which has helped the town a lot. And then there will be soon two DC chargers available for public use in, in, by the end of the summer. Uh, this is the vehicle transition timeline that, uh, that I have suggested for the town to be on track to reduce uh, emission, vehicle emission by 2050. If the town is following these transition timeline, it will be easy. It, it will be like simpler and smooth transition and uh, will be able to reach its goal by 2050. For my recommendations and uh, for my recommendation, one of the recommendation would be if the town is planning to transition its vehicle next year, I would recommend if the if there are ten vehicles to be transitioned, at least three of them should be zero vehicle, zero emission vehicles. When it comes to light duty vehicles, since the town has the infrastructure currently to support in the next year. When it comes to heavy duty vehicles, uh, one of the another suggestion that I would like to give is to have battery swapping system. There are companies which have uh, the, uh, the there are companies which have a battery swapping system which actually works like if if the car's battery died, you go there and then they'll just swap the battery, which takes ten to fifteen minutes, so you don't have to wait like four or five hours for your for your car to charge. So I think this is also going to be beneficial speci specifically for heavy duty vehicle, which sometimes take overnight to charge. Like some vehicles, like if they take, if the sedans and the SUVs take four to six hours to charge, uh, as I mentioned before, it takes about 3.6 uh, kilowatt per hour per mile for a heavy duty vehicle charge. So if they are going to take overnight to charge and it's, uh, sometimes it's not efficient for the town to have those vehicles in the need of emergency. Another one would be to plan the in charging infrastructure uh, once the once uh, the town has decided to buy those vehicles. It would be better to plan the charging infrastructure, as I mentioned, the heavy duty vehicles required uh, more uh, charging time than the light duty vehicles. Also to keep an eye for the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, uh, in the next five or 10 years, the technology is going to be expanding and popular. And since the energy crisis is gonna come, uh, like California right now is facing an energy crisis due to its electric, uh, heavy burden on the electric vehicles. That is why they have slowly started to switch on hydrogen fuel cell. There are about 59 hydrogen refueling stations 
but only 40, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, and 42 of them are in California. So I think uh, that they had to make switch to the hydrogen fuel cell. And I am sure that soon New England and Massachusetts will have to do uh, it because there is a lot of pressure to switch to electric vehicles that uh, there will be load on the utility companies to provide that much of energy to support those electric vehicles. Uh, also for the equipments, currently there are no equipments that are that efficient, like the leaf blowers and lawnmowers, but definitely there can be like one or two equipments that are, that do operate from battery. And then the others for the meantime, until the technology evolves can operate on gasoline. So at least there is like five or 10% of those equipments are in, uh, zero emissions. So I think these are my suggestions for the town. I, and, I, and I really hope that uh, these suggestions work. Um, thank you. Thank you, honey. That was very informative um, and interesting. I, I have to say, I didn't know about battery swapping. I didn't realize that was even an option. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why we're not doing that instead of, uh, instead of charging stations. Um, it seems to me that's, that's the obvious right way to go, right, in the long run, if you don't want to have to wait to recharge your car. And it sort of mimics what we already do with our little propane outdoor barbecues and, <laughs> You know, are we yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yes, and it I, also takes about ten to fifteen minutes for yeah. the swapping. So. Of course, the the automobile or the or the vehicle has to be set up for that for it to be easy, right? Um, and I don't. Uh, yes, yeah, so there is a certain type of infrastructure that needs to be built, but to build that infrastructure is about ten to fifteen percent cheaper than building a gas station. Yeah, right. So yeah. it's still a win-win situation, right. uh, but the technology, uh, the there are only few uh, companies that are in the market, and one of them, which is U.S. based, is in San Francisco. Yeah, interesting. I have to say, I'm also very skeptical about hydrogen. Um, I just can't get images of the Hindenburg out of my head. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> Um, and there are other ways to do hydrogen vehicles, of course, that are not particularly green. So um, I'm glad we're talking just about hydrogen gas, but I still, um, I have been a hydrogen skeptic for some time, um, but we'll see. All right, Michael, you have a, your hand up. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I need to head out, but I just want to say thank you, honey, for presenting um, and, and working hard on the, on that inventory and kind of yeah. starting to create a roadmap for for the city and for the municipality to to achieve that transportation goal that that we have so i mean this this is great um yeah i i do have some questions and maybe we somehow can um continue this conversation and we'll continue uh, to look into the inventory and such but yeah thank you um for that hard work this summer and in putting that together for us if I can jump Thank in real you. quick, Lori. Um, Michael, if you have specific questions, feel free to send them to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate it, thanks. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I wanna have a look at the slides too, because a lot of it went by a little faster than I could follow. So um, I may have I may have more questions. Um, but it's great to uh, know where we are. Yeah, if Stephanie, you would like to share my email, I would be happy to answer any questions that the group has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, if you, um, questions will have to go through me, honey. Um, okay. We just have some certain requirements about how we communicate, but just mm -hmm. so um, members can send me questions and I will work with you, honey, and to get the responses and get them back to folks. Yeah, I would um, be happy to answer. In Honey's presentation, I will send it out following this uh, meeting, and it will be added to the online packet. All right. Um, thank you again, Honey. If there are no other questions. With that, I think we are 
on to staff updates, right? Okay. First of all, before Honey leaves, I just want to say very quickly what a pleasure it's been to work with her. Um, she's just brought such a great energy to the work and um, it's just, it's been a joy and I'm really going to miss having you around. I think we all up here on the mezzanine are going to miss you, honey. So thank you for everything you've done and um, really looking forward to getting the final report. So other than the slide presentation, there is actually a final report that you will all receive a copy of when it's completed. So thanks so much, honey. I just wanted to say that publicly. Thank you. It was a pleasure working for the time. It was a pleasure working with you, Stephanie. Thanks. Okay. All right. Staff updates. So I'm going to give a quick summary just so it's in staff updates of some of the things we covered already. Um, but I'm just going to go back so it's summarized in one place. So first of all, um, heat pump program. We are moving forward with drafting a contract with the provider. So we are hoping to get that completed. I'm hoping by the end of next week, I can't guarantee it because if there's any changes, then there's gonna be a little bit of back and forth, but I'm hoping we don't have to do much of that if any at all. So that's moving forward. As soon as it's fully executed, I'll be able to announce who the provider is and hopefully we will be launching the program. Um, I would say, you know, within a month or two of signing the contract, because there are some things that need to be put to get pulled together before the program is officially launched. So I would say September, October would be around the time of official launch. Um, the Valley Bike Program, really exciting. Um, that launch is happening on August 12th. There is an event that's happening in Northampton. I think I announced it at the last meeting, but if I didn't, um, public is invited. Uh, there will be some of the new bikes from Drop Mobility, who is our um, our, con our consultant that we're working with. Um, and they will bring some of their new bikes. They, the whole system will still be, at least at this point, is going to be kind of a mix of both. Um, but the the new bikes will slowly be making their way and will be transitioning from any of the Bewegan bikes to all drop mobility bikes and infrastructure. So again, August 12th at Pulaski Park in Northampton at noon, if you're interested, um, there will be an opportunity to ride them as well. And snacks will be provided. So, um, so that's, let's see, bike share, heat pumps, and then our CCA also a uh, really exciting time for that effort. We will be sending um, information out about, about that program probably within a month or so. Uh, we're just getting sort of finalizing some of the postcards and the notification that needs to go out because all three towns need to ensure that they approve uh, what those look like. And it also has to be in compliance with DPU requirements of what's being presented to the public. So that's going to be happening uh, soon as well. There will be a large community information session that will be via Zoom. And then each community will be doing some of their own independent individual outreach as well. And I'll be coordinating with you all as we move along with that process. So as far as the heat pump program and the CCA, I'll be, you know, I'll be working closely with you all in terms of like you know, maybe what's needed and what you all want to do and what fits in with both programs. So we can stay on top of that. Um, other than that, I think that's pretty much the summary that I have for today. Okay, thanks, Stephanie. Any questions for Stephanie? I want to say my daughter has become an enormous um, follower or user of bike shares in Washington, D.C., where they have an excellent program that I think might also be drop mobility. I um, don't remember, but they uh, she uses their bike share bikes to pretty much get everywhere. <laughs> so very inexpensive compared to any other sort of transportation in, in D.C. Well, and the fact that there are electric bikes, you know, makes all the difference. Yep. Yep. You can get to work and not be a sweaty mess in 100 degree humid heat of Washington in the summer. And here now, too. <laughs> um, ECAC member updates. Any other any updates? I would like to give an update 
just to make sure everybody's aware of what is going on with the library project. Would that be okay? Please go ahead. Um, Where? So let me try to give like the shortest possible summary um, off the top of my head, but Tony, for your sake, this has been a long drawn out process of um, potentially updating the Jones Library building. Um, and in 2022, I think we had a um, townwide. So there's so the way it works for schools in Massachusetts, like all of our tax money goes into big pools of money that then the school com school commission and the library group, I forget what it's called, MBLC or something, um, that then they dole out to different towns on as kind of grants. So like we submit a proposal to get some grant money from the library commission and they decide whether what com which communities to give money to. So we've been in the queue with them for several years. Um, you submit a preliminary idea. They tell you, okay, submit a more detailed idea, kind of go back and forth. It has to have some kind of programming benefit. Um, so this project's been going on probably for 10 years or more. Um, we finally got to the final stage and the town council approved it in 2022, I believe. And then there was a petition, a, a, a community petition. It didn't get quite enough signatures, but it was enough signatures that the town council put it up to a community vote. And so we had a community vote on whether we wanted to continue to pursue this project. And the community voted 63% in favor of continuing the project. The project would expand the Jones Library um, and add more programming, which I won't touch on because it's not as relevant to our conversation, but um, the relevant piece is that it would take the library off of natural gas. It would make it more efficient. It would put it on heat pumps and it would fix some of these. There's heat vac, there's HVAC plumbing and accessibility issues with the library that we need to fix regardless of whether we do the grant or not. Um, it's not cheap. It's about 15 I think it's $15.8 million that the town has committed to this project. Um, and the rest of the money is coming from funding from uh, the state that I talked about. That's the big chunk of it, plus um, some donations and some of the library trustee endowment money. Um, there's been a couple other decision points that happen along the way, like the council has to decide to authorize the money um, where there's there's still a group of vocal opponents to the project that continue to try to get different, to stop it basically. Um, earlier this year, we it, it finally went out for bid um, and only one bid came out back and it was really over budget. So we had to make the decision about whether to try to rebid it or not. Um, we did decide to rebid it and we have and the town, the library commission or the trustees have been making some changes to to the to the project to try to make the cost a little cheaper. So when we rebid, hopefully we'll get more than one bid and hopefully it won't be so far over budget. Um there's so they've they've done that project, that process, and there's two hearings coming up, one tonight at 6 30. And one tomorrow at 6 30. So then tonight one tonight is with the planning board. Oh. And the one tomorrow is with the Amherst Historic Commission. Oh, maybe tomorrow's not happening. But um anyway, there's there's a petition going around to try to get these boards to disagree with the updates again to try to stop the project. And one of the things they're saying is that they they changed the environmental benefits of the project. Um, so that's my very long-winded reason of bringing this up with this group, because I think it's important for us to be aware of what the actual changes are. Um, so what they, they have made no changes to the um, use of heat pumps and the removal of natural gas on the project. Um, so that continues to be 
a important part of the project. Um, and in my opinion, that's one of the most important parts. Like we have an opportunity to not only to ch make changes to the library that the library staff and the town support, but that also gets it off fossil fuels and makes it a more efficient building, which is really important to our, our climate goals. Um, it will, the new design has removed some of the cross laminated timber from the plans. So that was, um, there was a, a big push to make this building as sustainable as possible. The library trustees formed a sustainability committee focused on this, um, really innovative thinking went into it. But at the end of the day, um, they decided to remove that piece because it will save money, but also contractors have less experience working with CLT. And so they're hoping that this will help get more bids. Um, there's a windows on the roof that we're gonna add more sunlight, um, but actually that's better for sustainability because it will help put more solar panels on. Solar panels are not part of the initial design based on lots of different th re reasons and rules, but it's built to be solar ready. Um, and it's in line with this with the stretch code. So anyway, I'm just sharing all this because um, some of the some of the petitions that are going around are claiming that it's removed all the sustainability features of the building. Um, and I just want us all to be aware that that's not the case. Um, and if you feel passionate about it, you should speak at one of these things. Yes, Lori. Uh, I just wanted to ask, you said that the, uh, windows in the roof that they're going to remove those and that makes it more solar accessible. Is that what you were just saying? Or did you say that I didn't understand the comment about the windows in the, yeah, let me just read exactly what it is. Cause I can't, I'm, I'm not able to. Um, so, so the feature, the free, the features of the project that are still there is that it eliminates natural gas usage. It's net zero ready because it's ready for solar. Right. It's more efficient. It uses less, it will have less operating costs because of the natural gas. Right. And particularly, definitely if we use solar. Um, so I'm hoping that that'll be an immediate next step given all of the new tax credits. And I've been speaking with them about how they can leverage that. Right. Um, it create so that so there's other non-sustainability related features, like it provides a climate controlled space for the Civil War tablets, it preserves the look and feel of the original historic building, it creates teen space, more children's space. Um so yeah, it was just the sun the 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 sunlight yeah. thing I didn't understand. It sounded like they were taking away a a sunlight, a roof, uh, what is it called? A roof roof. Yes. Roof. And so the um, new addition, I'll just read this out to you. In the new addition, the roof monitor, in quotes, over the new central stairwell has been removed. Roof monitor. A roof monitor is a skylight to architect. Skylight. That's right. Okay, all right. So that, and that's fine because that probably makes it easier to put more solar in. Yeah. It. So it's um yeah, so that's and then it says keeping with the state stretch building code, metal roofing and brick exterior remain the most affordable options for the new addition because of their insulating values. So any plans to substitute substitute those have been dropped. Okay, good. Some of the landscaping has been scaled back. Um, but all shade trees remain as planned. So those are the only changes that have been made. And I think the historical commission and the planning board have to approve these changes so that then it can go back out to bid and then we'll see what happens. Right. If the bid still come back really high, the town is not, in my opinion, the town is not going to spend any more money on this. And we may end up having to drop the project. Um, what I don't think makes sense is to try to drop the project earlier than that because renovating the project is also going to cost the town just as much if not more money it may not include any of these features and um and there's no guarantee of, of when we'll be when we'll be able to do that and mm -hmm. the library is in poor shape so anyway just wanted to flag this because i think the sustainability piece has been weaponized a bit on this library project for quite a while um, and 
we have our, our voices is useful in, in clarifying, cutting through some of that noise, I guess. Right. Okay. Got it. The planning board meeting is at six 30 tonight, right after this meeting. Yes. Yeah. And then my husband just like pokes head in and said he thought the historical meet commission's meeting was postponed, but I don't know anything if that's true or not. Can't trust him. So. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That's very that's very useful, Laura. I, I have not been keeping up on that. I have been keeping up on too many other things. So I really appreciate updates like that. Um, anything else anyone wants to add? Other updates? I, I will say one thing. Um, I was contacted about uh, an ad for, uh, we're, we're short three members at the moment. Um, so the town, was it Amanda that, who contacted me? Um, I got Sam. contacted. Hmm? It's Sam. Samantha, Sam. Samantha, Samantha. She's our new communications manager. Right. I got contacted by her about an ad. There it is, Samantha, for ECAC recruitment. And I gave them a blurb and a picture that I think may show up on Facebook sometime soon. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we'll see. But again, we're still recruiting. We're short three members. So if you know anybody, please send them a note and send them to the uh, uh, town website where you can apply for town um, committees. Um, in particular, and we lost some pretty specific expertise. It'd be nice to find more of um, as we grow the committee again. All right, so with that, I think we still don't have any attendees. So, so public comment. Um, so there's no public comment. Meeting items for the next agenda. I think we, um, I'm sort of going out of order here. I'm sorry, meetings for the, for the next agenda we're sort of discussing. Stephanie, go ahead. Um, I just actually wanted to make sure that we talk about the next uh, meetings and attendance for the next meetings. Um, right. I'm not clear who's going to be around and who's not, and I'm going to be actually away for the meeting on the 14th. So um, should we just wanted to check in. And Dawn's going to be away for that meeting as well. So I just wanted to double check with other people. And Michael's not here, unfortunately, so I'm not exactly sure what his schedule is. Well, I'm pretty sure I will be around. Uh, I don't have any other travel plans. Anyone else planning on being out of town? Good, Steve. Yeah, I, I will likely not be able to participate on the 14th. I'll be transitioning from one place to another by boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you won't have a quorum. Okay, so then let's, why don't we try to find another date for that meeting then? Um, okay, we're on down. Um, let's just take a look quickly at the calendar here. Uh, moment. I do want to talk about town manager goals. I don't want it to wait too long. Um, we could do the 7th or the 21st and have two meetings two weeks in a row to really we do the 21st and the 28th or the 7th and or the 7th and the 21st. Give months because. Oh, sorry. In August. Um, it, the, the 14th won't work. I'm thinking to either move that meeting to the 7th or the 21st. So that so we, um, I, I think I, I would, did, oh, sorry, Lori. Sorry, I was gonna say, I would think I would prefer the 21st because I'd like to pull together statements for town manager goals. And I need, you know, you need guys need a few days to write something and I need a few more days to pull something together. So, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, two, two thoughts. One, I would not be able to join on the 21st. Um, mm -hmm. But I also, I did text Anna just to find out what's going on. She said that her committee is in charge of the town manager goals and they haven't put it on the agenda yet. So it'll probably happen in September. So all to say, like, I think if we canceled and just met on the 28th and talked about it, we would still be okay time-wise. Right. That what would happen in September that... We would the committee, which I'm not sure which committee it is, one of the council committees is start will start to talk about town man town manager goals in September. It's probably okay. GOL. Yeah. So I think if we get them 
our thoughts by mid-September early, like we'll be ahead of the game. Okay. So then I really need folks to send me something and I'll try to pull together a draft report for the 28th. I'll try to have something for us to discuss and wordsmith um, so that we can have it ready for shortly after that. But I'll send reminders out if I don't get, if I don't get something from everybody by next week. Um, and I'll try to actually work on it. Um, pull together as much as I can. Uh, <laughs> just assign, I mean, feel free to say, Laura, can you write the update this section? Like I, I will. Okay. Let me, let, me let me see what I let me see what I can get. I, I think I'm gonna organize it differently than last year, but um, but we'll see. I'll yeah. See what I get. Um all right, other. So then we just skip the, so the proposal is to skip the meeting on the 14th and just meet on the 28th. What do folks think? Okay. That works for me. All right, then. I think that's what we'll do. And everybody can be here on the 28th? Uh, I think so. Sorry, I'm just double checking something. I may have a conflict on the 28th, which is that meeting with um, Climate Chief Hoffer. Melissa Hoffer. Oh, that's so right. we're to hear from you about that. Because I think, cool. yeah, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I think the time, the time that I understood was going to be like at four o'clock on mm -hmm. one of the nights that we have a meeting. And I think it might be that one on the 28th. So let me double check. Um, and I apologize. I haven't received any kind of definitive link yet, but I think it's likely to be that day on the 28th. So I could either arrive late um, I don't know how long that meeting is going to go. I think it's probably only going to be an hour at the most. So it would be like four to five. So it might be just like a half hour late, or we could start the meeting later so that I could give you an update. That would later would be okay with me five to seven or even six to eight. How do other people feel about that? Does that work? Okay. Why don't we go for, let's say five 30 to seven 30 and split the difference on the 28th. Okay, that's great. Cause then I can definitely be there. So that's a Zoom meeting you're going to. With Correct, conference. yep. And then we get to hear about it. Yeah, then I can give you an update. That'd be great. Put that on the agenda too. <laughs> so pretty save, okay, I've just changed that. And on the 14th, we will not be meeting but I'm gonna leave it on my calendar as write the report. Reserve that time to work on the report. Um, okay, anything else? Items for the agenda we've sort of been listing as we've gone along, I think. So if there's still no other participants, nope. Um, see you all in four weeks. Have a good August. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Again. Bye.